remember, happiness is not about having what you want. Because not everything we want is good for us. No? Happiness is really finding contentment in the things that God has been giving you. Amen? Hindi mo po ibig sabihin na hindi ka na pwedeng mag-desire ng something na gusto mo. Bibigay din naman ng Lord yon in time. Okay? Pero mahalaga sa lahat, let's dwell on thanking God for what we already have. Amen? So, can you say to the person beside you, I am so blessed by the Lord. Ayan. Sabi nga, kung minsan naihingkit ka, Lord, bakit siya meron? Ako wala, hindi ako blessed. <laughs> blessed ka po. <laughs> Wag mo uh, wag mo i-focus yung wala sa iyo. I-focus mo yung nasa iyo. Because you have so much to be thankful to God for. Amen. Yun po yung sekreto ng kaligayahan kay Lord. Amen. Our human disappointments often turn out to be preludes to divine surprises. Okay? Can we say that again? Our human disappointments oftentimes turn out to be preludes to divine surprises. Never prejudge how God works in your life. God's desire is always to bless you and to bring good to your life. When something bad happens to you, God allowed it to carry out a purpose. And that purpose primarily is about changing you, your attitude, your reaction, your relationships with people. God allows you to go through times of pain, disappointment, and suffering because He wants you to be more aware of what needs to change in you. Most of the time kasi po, kaya tayo nadadala ng problema kasi negative ang reaction natin. O hindi tayo marunong mag-handle ng sitwasyon, kaya lalong lumalala at lalong sumasama ang loob natin. Kasi we do not have the wisdom yet to really learn to handle that, so we overcome. And the reason why God allows us to go through those challenges in life is because He's training you to overcome by developing the right attitude that will help you uh, be delivered from the pain that you're experiencing. Like learning to forgive, for example. You know, forgiveness is commanded by Christ, not for the benefit of the offender, because He will have to answer to the Lord for what the person did to you. Forgiveness is commanded for your benefit. So that you will be released from bitterness and be able to receive the blessing that God has prepared for you. Because when you obey God, there is always a reward for your obedience. And so when you obey the Lord, mapi-bless ka. Eh kung ikaw magiging bitter na lang, ay hindi ka mapi-bless. Bakit? Kasi bitterness is a sin. That's why Jesus Christ commanded us in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, that whenever you come to the Lord to pray, if you want God to hear your prayers, then the first thing you need to do, okay, is to forgive. The first thing. Hindi pa pag tayo nagpe-pray, humingi rin tayo ng tawad sa ating kasalanan, tama? Yung manimit na hindi natin nahingan ng tawad, yung bitterness. Kasi hindi natin alam, kasalanan pala yun. That's why the first thing that Jesus wants, in order to be sure that God, the Father will hear your prayer, is that you forgive those that you hold anything against. So, hindi sinabi ni Jesus, patawarin mo pag humingin ng tao. Hindi po yun. Patawarin mo pag lumapit na sa iyo at inamin na nakamali siya. Hindi. Patawarin mo siya kahit hindi pa niya inaamin. Patawarin mo siya kahit hindi pa siya humingi ng tao sa iyo. Kasi forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness is about you. Because God wants you to walk in love for your enemies, being good to those who hate you, blessing those who curse you, because that's how He makes you like Christ. And the more you become like Christ, the happier and the peaceful your life will be. Because remember, true happiness and peace is not about changing your circumstances. We find true happiness and peace not because our circumstances have changed, not because that person has changed, but because we have changed. When I change, I am able to overcome the situation and I'm able to find peace. Kasi nagbago na ako. Amen? So pagkasabi sa iyong katabi, ang susi sa kaligayahan ay hindi yung magbago yung taong yun, kundi ikaw ang magbago. <laughs> Amen? Okay. 
And you know, those disappointments that you're experiencing, actually, when you respond to God and allow Him to change your attitude, ultimately results in blessing. Okay? And that is what happened to the early church. You know, the early church experienced the first blood in the martyrdom of Stephen. It was already sending some shockwaves in the Christian community that was just born after the day of Pentecost. So there were around 3,000 now to 5,000 believers by the time we get to the story of Philip and Stephen in Acts chapter 6 down to Acts chapter 8. And so the church already felt the impact of persecution because one of them was executed in the eyes of all the people. And Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, was the one who gave authorization for the execution of Stephen, the evangelist, by stoning to death. Remember the story in chapter 7. And so the church now felt that being a Christian is no longer just a, uh, a joy because uh, you have Christ, you have salvation, but now it's going to cost you even your life. Okay? And so right after the execution of Stephen in chapter 7, in chapter 8 we see how the gospel, because the disciples were scattered from Jerusalem because of the persecution of Saul. We see that all of these events taking place is simply fulfilling the outline, the mandate that Jesus gave in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Can we do that right now? Once you understand this verse, you will understand the outline of the entire book of Acts. Okay? So Acts chapter 1, 8, this is what Jesus said to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is chapter 1, right? Chapter 2, they will receive the Holy Spirit, as He promised. And then, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. From chapter 2, okay, up to chapter 7, Christians were increasing in Jerusalem as many Jews were turning to Jesus Christ. So the church was growing in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, not just in Jerusalem. In all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And because the apostles were not leaving Jerusalem. In fact, let's go now to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. When Saul started persecuting the church after he had Stephen executed, Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, started persecuting the church in Jerusalem. And the reason he was persecuting the church was because he believed that these people were following a false messiah. Saul was in Jerusalem during the events of the crucifixion of Christ. And he knew, according to the belief of many Jews, that he was a fake Messiah. And so he was also in agreement to the execution of Jesus. Saul was a member of a synagogue in Jerusalem called the Synagogue of the Freedman that we, will, that we encountered in chapter 7. Okay? He was a member of the Synagogue of the Freedman. He was from Cilicia, and some of those who were members of the synagogue were from Cilicia. He was born in Tarsus in the province of Cilicia outside of Israel. Okay? And so he would go to Jerusalem during major feasts, like what happened Feast of Pentecost, and he would worship there in the synagogue of the freedman. And so he was very much aware about the circumstances of the crucifixion of Christ. So for him, you know, Jesus was rightly executed because he was a false messiah. That's why he thought that these Christians were all deceived. They were all deluded by this man. And so he wanted to be sure that he would stamp out Christianity from Israel. Because he believes it is a perversion, it's a twisted version of Judaism. And so that's what he believed. And so because of that belief that he was doing right, that he was doing this in the service of God. You know, may mga tao sa mundo na pumapatay believing that they're doing it according to the will of God. Alright? This is all po ganoon. He thought this was the will of God. And so was there giving approval to the death of Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. You remember Acts 1.8? Jesus said, you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. Then he said, in all Judea and Samaria. Okay? So, while the church was growing in Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus was waiting for them to move out to Judea and Samaria. The problem is nobody was moving. Wala pong nagpipreach outside of Jerusalem. And so what did Jesus do? He allowed Saul to rise up as a persecutor of the church. And because Saul persecuted the church, his plan now is being carried out. All the disciples, imagine there were more than 5,000 of them. 
all the disciples, all, uh, all, except the apostles. The, now, why did the apostles choose to stay in Jerusalem? Because naniwala po apostol at that time na yung kaligtasan ay para lang sa mga Hudyo. They cannot believe that the Samaritans and the Gentiles out there are, will be included in God's plan of salvation because they believe the Messiah came for Israel only. That's why they cannot believe that the Holy Spirit that was given to them can also be given to Gentiles. The Gentiles are anyone who is not a Jew is a Gentile. They understand that. And because of Christ's command, Jude, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, they were hesitant to go out of Jerusalem because they believe salvation is for the Jews only. And they were wrong. And later on, Christ will be correcting them. Okay? And so, they stayed in Jerusalem. So even though all the disciples were forced to scatter, that these apostles remained in Jerusalem. What did Jesus command to them? Jerusalem, Judea, they are not moving. Okay? Now let me tell you this. When God tells you to do something and you delay and you disobey, God has a way of making you do it. You understand that? The gospel was not going out of Jerusalem. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, they're not moving. Okay. I'm going to use soul now to drive you out. Even the persecution of the church was part of the ordained purpose of God. When the church of Jesus Christ is not fully obeying what Christ wants us to do, so we realize what is more important. The priorities of God are more important than our human priorities. Whatever God wants you to do, God expects you to do it. If you don't do it, He will find a way to make you do it. Do you understand that? You see, the church was not moving out, and so God, God used soul to persecute the church. Now, the disciples have no choice but to get out, to flee for their lives. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. The apostles were the, one, the ones given the command. And because they would not relieve Jerusalem, God used others to do it. Do you understand that? And so that all these disciples preached the word wherever they went. Judea and who went down to Samaria, verse 5. One of them went down to Samaria and preached the gospel. And because of that, the Samaritans came to Jesus Christ. In fact, the signs and wonders that was manifest in the ministry of Philip, who went down there, demons were being cast out. There were many acts of deliverance, healings, miraculous healings, that the apostles heard it in Jerusalem. What's happening down there? The Samaritans are coming to Christ. Who? Huh? They are a defiled people. <laughs> Mixed blood. And so they had to go down to see what the Holy Spirit was doing. And so when they saw the work of Christ, the Holy Spirit, they had no choice but to lay hands on the Samaritans so they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They understand this. It took time for the apostles to be convinced that Jesus wanted the gospel to go beyond Israel itself. Among the Jews. Because the Samaritans were not pure-blooded Jews. They were more mestizo Jews. They had more gentle blood during the Old Testament. The Assyrians brought Assyrians there, intermarried with the surviving Israelites, and that became the Samaritan race. It's a mixed-blood race. That's why the pure Jews living in, in Judea and in Galilee looked down on the Samaritans and did not consider them as real Jews. So they don't believe that they are going to be included in God's promise of salvation to the Jews because they are not real Jews. Okay? But it took a Philip, who is a Hellenistic Jew. A Jew was not born in Israel. Jew, a Jew was born outside the Israel, who came there for the festival. It took a Hellenistic Jew, not the pure Jews like the apostles, to reach out to Samaria. You understand that? And so the purpose of Christ was carried out. And so Philip was used by Jesus to reach out to Samaria. And then that's chapter 8, right? So what's the next part of Christ's plan? Jerusalem? Judea, Samaria was the next phase. To the ends of the earth. That means to the Gentile world out there, outside of Israel. And so who's going to carry out that part of Jesus' mandate? The, the apostles obviously were not going to do it. They were still staying in Jerusalem. Okay? 
Why? Because they did not understand. Nakasama po yung mga Gentiles sa plano ng kaligtasan ng Diyos. And that's why because they were not moving, God raised up Saul. Si Saul po, naging, nagamit rin po ng Lord para matupad yung plano niya kasi dahil sa kanyang persecution, nakarating ang gospel sa Judea and Samaria. Right? And now that nakarating na Samaria, of course, the Lord Jesus was now saying, next phase na. Sinong gagamitin niya ngayon? To the ends of the earth. And you will see, Saul was going to be raised up to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? Now, the ministry of Philip already gave us a preview of how the gospel reached the ends of the earth. Remember? Philip was instructed by the Holy Spirit to meet that Ethiopian eunuch on the road to Gaza. He did not know that by preaching the gospel to that Ethiopian eunuch, that eunuch will go back to his land and share the gospel to the queen of the Ethiopians. And later on in history, by the 4th century AD, the church of Ethiopia was born. Ethiopia became a Christian nation. And the seed was planted by Philip. In the time of the apostles, Ethiopia was the ends of the earth in the south. Kasi they had their own understanding of what are the nations of the world. Kasi they have not explored the other parts of the world yet. So to the, towards the south of Africa, Ethiopia to them was the end of the earth. In the time of the apostle Paul, Spain to the west was the ends of the earth. That's why Paul wanted to go to Spain in his letter to Romans. In Romans 15, after visiting you in Rome, I intend to go to Spain to preach where Christ has not been preached. Because he knew that Jesus wanted the gospel to reach the ends of the earth. Now Spain in that time was known by the people in the Middle East as the ends of the earth. Because they have not yet discovered the Americas. It will take Columbus later on, a European to discover the Americas. Remember that? Okay, Columbus in history. So they thought Spain was the end of the earth. And because Paul wanted to obey Christ, he wanted to reach Spain, the ends of the earth. That's why God raised the right person, Saul. Amen? So Saul was, u- was used by Christ to persecute the church in order to bring them out of Judea to Judea and Samaria, but now he's going to use them to carry out the next phase of his plan. Listen to what we're learning here. God can use the, even the evil of people to carry out his purposes. God can use even the evil of a Judas to fulfill his plan for his son who will die for the sins of the world. No evil can succeed in this world without God's permission. Sabi nga po ni Jesus, not even a sparrow will fall from the sky without your father's will. Kahit nga ibon eh, di ba may mga ibon na bigla na bubagsak. Tapos patay, tumama sa windshield, patay. <laughs> nasa gasaan, patay. Sabi ni Jesus, kahit isang sparrow, hindi mamamatay na walang pahintulot ng aking ama. Even if you desire to do evil, you cannot successfully carry out that evil plan if God did not allow you. But if you successfully carry out that evil, pinayagan ng Diyos yun. Because alam ng Diyos, lahat ng evil choices will have evil consequences. Tapayagan ng Diyos, makasala ka para maharap mo yung bunga ng kasalanan mo para maintindihan mo kung gano'ng kamali ang paggawa ng kasalanan. That's why God does not spare us from the consequences of our sin. That's why in the story of the prodigal son, Jesus portrayed the Father in the story as your heavenly Father. And He portrayed that prodigal son as all of us. You see, how, the, how can the father allow his son to take his inheritance? Buhay na buhay pa siya. Binigay niya mana abang buhay pa siya. Dahil gusto ng anak niya. At alam niya, itatapon niya lang yun sa walang kabulong buhay. That's why even the persecution of Saul was carrying out Jesus' purpose. Jesus is never hindered by human evil. He allows human evil to play right into his plans. You understand that? But even for Saul, who persecuted the church, there will be consequences that we will see in a while that Jesus will be bringing to his life. Although he, Jesus is going to save him, is going to raise him up to be his apostle to the Gentiles, yet he will still suffer the consequences of persecuting the church. We will see that in a while. Okay? So, yung kaaway nyo, imbes na, you know, lagi na lang maging daily meditation yung ginawa sa iyo, patawarin mo na. He bless mo. So, you know, whenever you bless your enemy, you're opening heaven to reach out to the person. 
cursing the person will only bring you down to his level kasi nagiging magkamukha na kayo. Yan sabi ko sa inyo, pagkala kayo nakapokus sa pangit, po mapangit din tayo. Eh. Diba? Pag lagi mo nakikita yung maganda sa kapag, gumaganda ka rin. Totoo hindi. Tsaka sa mga ngayon pala nakarinig nito, gusto nating turuan ng leksyon yung tao, di ba? Sino mahilig magturo ng leksyon sa nakakasakit sa kanila? Sino natuto? Sino natuto? <laughs> Gagawin ko sa kanya yung ginawa niya sa akin para matuto siya. Mali. Natuto ka maging kamukha niya. Natuto ka maging katulad niya. Eh siya sanay na dun eh. Paghabit ng tao, kahit anong gawin mo sa kanya, handa siyang ipaglaban ng sarili niya kasi sanay siya sa kanya eh. Hindi mo siya matuturuan ng leksyon. Lalo na paghabit niya na yun. Ang dami dyan sa mga sa daanan, di ba? Mga bad habits sa driving. Gawin mo sa kanyang ginawa niya, ganun pa rin siya. <laughs> o oh, di ba, may taxi driver tayo dito eh. <laughs> di ba? Eh, ugali, kasi yun eh. Ang pangit nun, ikaw, na hindi ganun, naging katulad niya. Dahil gusto mo siyang turuan ng leksyon. Ikaw yung natuto, hindi siya. You understand that? You can never control what people do to you, but you can control how you respond and react. Do not choose to go down to their level because if you go down to the level of enemy, tatapakan ka niya. Kasi makamukha na kayo eh. Ano pa, isusumbat mo sa kanya. Eh pare, ginawa mo sa akin, ginawa ko siya, ginawa mo na rin sa akin eh. Makamukha na tayo, ba't ka magagalit sa akin? Pareho na tayo. Nakuha po natin. Can you say to the person beside you, don't get even. Get over. Kasi pag get even, that means gusto mong pumantay, magiging magkamukha kayo. Uh, diba? Ba't ka pa magagalit sa kaaway mo, eh, pareho na kayo. Okay. Kaya ang Diyos po, tinuturuan po ang church, wag gaganti. And God can use that person hurting you to change your life. If you respond in the right way, you grow in the midst of the challenge, you're able now to overcome the challenge. Later on, pag may nag-insulto sa'yo, hindi ka na natatama, hindi ka na naapektuhan kasi marunong ka na magpatawat, marunong ka na magpasensya. Kasi nagbago ka na eh. You have changed. You have learned to understand the weaknesses of human nature. Ako, nakaka-offended. Why should I be upset when somebody offends me? Parang lang naman kami. Imperfect. You know, sometimes when you're surprised at the evil that people do to you, it's maybe you're forgetting you're living in a fallen world and that you're also fallen like that person. Yung paradang naman tatin ko minsan yung naging, nag, kaya tayo naging judgmental, naging tayo condemning, masada tayong galit, mayabang kasi tayo eh. Natapa kasi yung kayabangan natin ng tao eh. Kaya nagre-react tayo. Pero sa totoo lang, pareho naman tayo makasalanan. Is there anyone here who has never offended anyone all your life? O di. Wala may exception. All of us are guilty. There is no one innocent. Amen? Alam ng Diyos yan, kaya pinapayagan niyang masaktang ka dahil gusto niyang baguhin ka. Hindi yung tao, may, may oras na doon sa taong yon, pero yung oras mo ngayon na. Kasi kung di ka magbago, masisira buhay mo sa taong yan. Ikaw masisira, hindi siya. Kasi nagre-react ka sa galit at mali yung mga desisyon ginagawa mo dahil nagre-react ka. You are destroying yourself. You are making yourself a slave of your enemy. You understand that? That's why Jesus said, forgive. When you forgive, you overcome your enemy. Kasi hindi ka na niya maapektuhan. You understand? Ano ibig sabihin ng pagpapatawad? Forgiveness means putting the memory of the offense behind you and you never look back. Kahit maalala mo, hindi mo na yung ididwell. Tapos na sa akin yan, pinatawad ko na siya, Lord, I bless him, focus your mind on something else. Hindi mo na rin ikikwento yan kasi tapos na sa'yo yan. Pag may nagtanong, hindi mo na rin ikikwento, pare, ano ba nangyari sa inyo? Pare, hindi ayoko na pag-usapan niya. Tapos na sa akin niya, napatawad ko na siya. That is forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an electric shock that causes amnesia. You understand that? And forgiveness is a choice that every time you remember the offense, you don't focus on it, 
Sinasabi yung salita, napatawag ko, tapos hindi ko naisipin yan. I focus my mind on something else. And as you continue to refuse to entertain the memory, yung sugat mo ngayon, gagaling na. Kasi hindi mo na sinasariwa yung memory na nakakasakit. Understand that? So forgiveness is always a choice. It's not about what you feel. Pag lagi mong pinipili na hindi mo na babalikan yung, mem yung memory, tabi, Lord, close book na sa akin yan, bumabalik na naman, Lord, I will not dwell on this toast. Tapos na napatawas niya, God bless him. Focus your mind on something else. And as you develop that habit of focusing, of not dwelling on the memory, the wound begins to heal. That's why I tell you, time, that, time doesn't heal wounds. It only helps you forget them for a while until something triggers the wound again. Kasi nandiyan pa yung wound eh. It's only forgiveness can heal wounds. Only forgiveness. Because you made a commitment, hindi mo nababalakan yung ginawa niya. Choice mo na yon. At dahil choice mo lagi yon, yung sugat gagaling kasi hindi na siya nasasariwa. Dahil ayaw mo na isipin yung nangyari. Tapos na sa'yo yun. Yung po ang forgiveness. Okay? That is why, this is one of the things that the Lord is teaching us when God allows you to be hurt by someone. He is trying to change you. Eh, paano yan? Pero Lord, baguhin mo siya. Lord, ayusin mo siya. Lord, convict mo siya. Lord, konsensyahin mo siya. Di ba? Okay na naman mag-pray ng ganun. Pero kami saan, the more you pray like that, the more lumalala yung tao. Hindi eh. mo napapansin yun. Pag, pag may nagpe-pray na na, Lord, baguhin mo yung pangyayari sa buhay ko. Ayusin mo itong sitwasyon ko. Lord, ayusin mo yung tao ngayon. The more you pray, lumalala lalo eh. Uh, pakita niyo mga kabay. Sino sa inyo yung gano'ng experience? The more you pray about, the more it gets worse. Pakita us. Sige, takasan niyo. Gugulat kayo. Look around. Dami. <laughs> Kasi ang layunin ng Diyos, hindi yung baguhin niya yung tao, ikaw yung binabago. Para next time dumating, hindi ka naapektado kasi nagbago ka na eh. Kaya kung sabihin ng Lord, o oh, sige, alisin ko na siya. Pero darating na naman niya, may iba na naman. Galit ka na naman. Lord, palisin mo. Ay, nalis. Ayun. Let me dumating na naman. Ganun din. Oh, Lord, nalisin mo siya. Wala, habang buhay ka na lang magdurusa. Kasi nasa planet Earth ka pa eh. Kahit saan ka pumunta, may mga tao yung perfecto tulad mo. May mga kakasakit ng loob mo tulad rin ang pakakasakit mo sa loob ng iba. Kaya ang susi, ikaw ang magbago. When you change, you are able to overcome. And later on, hindi ka naapektado. Kasi nagbago na pananaw, puso at attitude mo. You understand that? That's why God allows evil in your life. He allows evil in order to change you and to carry out His purpose in your life if you respond in the right way. Imagine these disciples, kung sila naging bitter kay Saul, ano naman, hudyo pa naman yan, parisi pa naman, tapos ganito ang gagawin sa amin, hindi, walang aalis sa Jerusalem. They went out preaching the word wherever they went. They were preaching the gospel that was the subject of the persecution of Saul. Wala sila, hindi sila natatakot kung bakit sila umalis sa Jerusalem. Kasi they keep preaching the gospel na kinakalaban ni Saul. Because of their love for Christ. They understand that? That is why God will allow evil to touch your life. Because He is going to change you. To teach you to forgive. To teach you to trust God to vindicate you His way, not your way. To be patient. To learn to endure. And to learn to be gentle to those who hurt you. So that instead of making them an enemy forever, you're able to win them to your side because you're being kind to them. Kahit masama sila sa inyo, sabi ni Jesus, show kindness to your enemy. Do not return evil for evil. 1 Peter 3.9 but return the evil with blessing. Because ang desire ng Diyos, hindi yung talunay mo yung kaaway mo. Ang gusto ng Diyos, mawin mo siya to your side. Para wala ka ng kaaway. Amen? Kasi pag tinalo mong kaaway mo, at hindi siya, ayaw niyang tumanggap ng pakatalo, eh ba, lagi yung kaaway. Totoo hindi. Laging magiging kaaway mo yan. Kasi tinatalo mo eh. eh ayaw niyang magpatalo. At ay labang kayo habang buhay. Mahirap yung buhay na gano'n. Walang kapayapaan yung ganyang buhay. Pero you learn to be kind to the person. Alam mo kung may konsyensya pa yan, mawiwin mo yan to your side. Sa totoo lang, ako po, marami pa ako mga critics, mga detractors, 
mga naninira sa akin, I just show kindness to them. Alam mo nangyari? Sila, marami sa kanila ngayon, mga malapit ngayon sa akin. If you win your enemy to your side, you're no more enemy. But if you fight against them and defeat them, they will remain your enemy. You understand that? Yan ito yung tuturo sa atin ng Panginoon. So God allows the church to be persecuted by Saul. Hindi alam ni Saul, although pinapayagan siya ni Jesus na gawin niya sa kanyang mga uh, followers, na siya rin later on magsasuffer for him. Okay? Now, just look at the story now in chapter 9. The conversion of Saul. Chapter 9, can we read now? Verse 1 and following. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, yung po yung tawag sa, sa Christian faith in that early stage, the way, kasi followers of the way, kasi Jesus said, I am the way. Okay? Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, why was Saul, who started persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem, going to travel so far into the north, outside of the borders of Israel, into Syria, go into Damascus, and arrest any Christians that he will find there? Paano nakarating yung mga Christians doon? And di ba, kakapritso ng gospel? Yung Jerusalem, yun pala yung unang naging mga Christian. Hindi pa nakakalabas. Nakarating lang yung next sa Judea, Samaria, pero wala pa nakakapunta ng Damascus para mag-preach ng gospel. E bakit ay naisip na may mga Christians doon? Ha? Di pa si Philip, as rich on as para Samaria, at yung some of those scattered went up to the north and started preaching. Later on, may established yung Church of Antioch. Makikita natin later on yan. Pero hindi Damascus. Walang pumunta sa Damascus para mag-preach ng gospel. So bakit niya Gustong puntaan Damascus para aristoin ng mga Christian doon. Kasi marami po sa mga na-persecute sa Jerusalem, nung tumakas, maraming pumunta sa Damascus outside of the borders of Israel para siguradong hindi na sila mahuli. Kasi nasa ibang bansa na sila. Di ba yung mga kriminal ganyan pag inahabol ng polis? Pag tumawid na ng border, ay, hey, diktas na kami. Hindi na pwede tumawid ng polis doon kasi ibang bansa na yun. Eh. Ako yung point. That's what the Christians did. Many of them fled to the north, to Damascus, outside of the borders of Israel, para wala nang jurisdiction si Saul, para hulihin sila. You got that? Eh, may intelligence si Saul. May intelligence in for support siya. Kaya nalaman niya, may mga Christian na palang tumakbo sa Damascus. Aha. Akala niyo, makakaligtas kayo sa akin. Kahit saan kayong dulo na mundo pupunta, pupunta ko kayo! Anong, what does this reveal about the personality of Saul? Persistent. Si Saul, yung tipong personalidad, pag sinimula niya, hindi siya magpapahinga hanggang din na natapos ang misyon niya. Yun yung kailangan ni Jesus, yung mga ganun. Kaso lang ginagamit siya sa maling paraan. You understand this? If your enemy is very persistent, I tell you, potential yan na magiging... <laughs> preacher of the gospel. <laughs> Kasi, yan po, ay eh, tatapusin ang misyon. Hindi yung magpapahinga ang tinatapos ang misyon niya. Ganon po si Saul eh. Hindi, hindi yan po natin. Kaya mo kahit yung mga kaaway nyo, huwag kayong masyadong magpadala doon sa mga negative na pinapakita sa iyo. Kumakulit sila, admire them for their persistence. Kasi asset yan eh. Kasi lang they're using their persistence in the wrong way. Okay? Yung mga nang loloko, Diba? Yung mga swindler. Magaling sila mag-invento ng story. Yeah. Galing yun. Asset yun. Kaso lang mali ang paggamit. Si Jesus, pag tinitignan niya ikaw, hindi niya pinapokus yung kahinaan mo. Tinitignan niya yung lakas sa likod ng kahinaan mo. When he saw Simon Peter, anong sabi niya kay Simon Peter? John chapter 1, verse 42. First time nakita si Simon Peter. Sino si Simon Peter? Ito yung apostol na one day, i-deny, nakilala niya si Jesus nung panahon na natakot na siya. Okay? Takotin rin pala yan. Okay? Unstable. Masyadong balimbing. ba? Ibig sabihin, Simon Peter is a kind of personality na magbaling, madaling magbago kung umiiba ang circumstances. Ibig sabihin, malambot siya masyado, unstable. Right? Anong sabi ni Jesus na nakita siya? You are Simon, son of John. Impressed. Kailala niya ako. 
you will be called Kefa. You know what Kefa is in, in Aramaic? That's an Aramaic word transliterated into the, the gospel. The word Kefa means rock. Hindi po maliit na stone. Rock. Tinraslate ngayon sa Greek ni John, Petros or Peter. Kasi ang katumbas po ng Kefa, which is feminine in the Aramaic language, yung original word ni Jesus is Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic in his earthly life. So, kinukot ni John yung original Aramaic word na ginamit ni Jesus na narinig niya. Okay? And then, tinraslate niya sa Greek kasi Greek yung pakasulat niya ng kanyang gospel. Tinraslate sa English. Ayan, okay. Kaya ngayon, English na. So, yung Greek is Petros. Dapat ang tamang salin kasi feminine ang kefa, dapat Petra. Tama? Kaso lang lalaki siya. So, kailangan maging masculine ending, Petros. Pero ang meaning, rock. Doon ang galing original. Bakit kaya sinabi ni Jesus, you will be called the rock? Alam ba niya yung gagawin ni Simon? Magiging balimbing? Magiging unstable person? Magiging mahina? At the moment of temptation? Anong sabi niya? I'm going to make a rock out of you. One day, you will be called the rock. Why? Kasi si Jesus hindi nagpo-focus kung anong kahinaan mo ngayon. Fino-focus niya kung anong gagawin niya sa buhay mo. You see, Jesus doesn't focus on what you are right now. He's more focused on what you will become by His grace. Ganon po ang isang leader. Ang leader, hindi fino-focus yung mga problema ang nakikita niya sa mga tao. Ang tinitignan niya lagi, potensyal ng tao. Dahil lagi na kayo potensyal, he finds himself encouraging, encouraging the person hanggang ma-overcome niya yung mga problema kasi inspired siya ng leader na laging tinitignan yung potensyal niya. Mga magulang, gusto niyong maipalabas ang pinakamagaling sa mga anak ninyo? Who of you wants to bring out the best in your children? Do not focus on the problems you see in them. Lahat ng tao may combination ng weakness and strength. Kung puro weakness na lang tinitignan mo, lalo mo lang masisira ang anak mo. Kasi puro kagalit, puro ka ano, negativity. I-focus mo yung namganda sa kanya. Focus on his potentials and inspire him to become better. Kasi you make him feel you can be a great person anak kasi mo potential ka. Nakikita ko potential mo. Kaya mo maging dakilang writer, uh, singer, or artist like yung mga anak ko. Kaya mga anak ko inspired kasi lagi ko sa lang pinasabi, you'll be a great, based on the gifting, a great singer, songwriter, serial artist, si Faye, a great manager. Kasi hinahanap ko yung potential nila. Kaya they grew up to their maximum potential. Because I focus on potential. You understand that? Yung ating Filipino culture, hindi ganyan. Ang tawag po sa ating kultura, shame-based, like most Asian countries. Shame-based culture means, kinokorek by shaming. Kinokorek, ang maling ugali, papayain, ibababa, lalaitin, you know, ikakurse. Ganyan po ang shame-based cultures. Kaya tayo, damage ang ating mga identity. Kaya, oh, how tayo sa importansya. Madaling magselos kasi, oh, how tayo sa importansya. Kasi hindi natin naranasan sa pamilya, puro negative, puro negative, puro sumpa, puro lait, puro degrading words. Yan po kultura natin. Kaya ang dami sa ating insecure. Ang dami yung security. Because na-damage tayo sa pamilya. Pero kita mo si Jesus, hindi ganun eh. Alam niya, ito yun eh. Alam niya, ito yung makakanulo sa kanya. Pero sabi niya, I'll make a rock out of you. Magiging baliktad ka kung ano ka ngayon. Because of what I will do in your life. Amen? Can you say to the person beside you, I will not focus on the problems I see in people. I will focus on their potentials and inspire them to be the person they were meant to be. You understand that? That's how God treats us. Okay? That's why even in the eyes of Jesus, when He allowed Saul to persecute the church, He allowed it because He's so potential in Paul. He is a real leader. And he's a leader who will not rest until he finishes his mission. Kailangan ni Jesus yung ganyan. That's why the Lord called him. You understand that? Okay? And so, 
Going back to the story of Paul's conversion, take a look now at verse 3. So, kumuha siya ng letters, verse 2 muna. He asked for letters from the Jerusalem uh, Sanhedrin. Kasi nga, labas na po ng border ng Israel and Damascus. So, wala siyang authority doon. You got that? Kaya wise yung mga Christians na tumakas doon. Wise. Okay? So, ang ginawa ni Paul, humingi ng authorization para mabigyan siya ng authority to arrest believers in Damascus even though outside siya ng borders ng Israel. He had to ask for authorization. You understand that? So, in other words, hindi mo sila talaga papatakasin. So, he was going there, verse 3, and I tell you, chapter 9, the chapter we're reading now, is the major turning point in the book of Acts. This is the major turning point. Because after this, Christianity will never be the same again. This man was going to be raised up by Christ in order to carry out his purpose. So verse 3, And he near Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who appeared to him? Jesus himself. And why do you think Jesus appeared to him instead of sending an angel to tell him the message? Why himself? You will see that in a little while. So, so, why are you persecuted? You, why do you persecute me? And so, asked, who are you, Lord? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Did you hear that? Saul was about to realize that when he hurts Christians, he is hurting Jesus Christ. He said, you're not just persecuting my followers. You are persecuting me. Pag-isabi sa yung katabi, pag sinaktan mo ang isang kapatid mo sa Lord, Si Lord ang nasaktan mo. Please go to Matthew 25 now. Matthew 25. That's why Paul is always exhorting us to forgive one another, to be gentle to one another, to be kind to each other. Verse 34, up to verse 14. What you do to your brother affects Jesus. Remember this. Then the king will say, this is the final judgment in Jesus' own words. To those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Can you say, wow? Yan ang inanda niya para sa iyo. Okay? Why? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I could imagine the believer saying, what? Next set of verses. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? Di ba nasa langit ka, Lord? Hindi ka naman manakita sa earth. Next verse. When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? Next verse. When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you, Lord? Nikaw namin nakita. Di ba nasa langit ka? Next verse. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Nobody can hurt you as a follower of Christ without hurting Jesus himself. And this is where as Saul reflected on those three days when he became blind, he was reflecting on this encounter. That's when he realized he was so wrong. He was so wrong in what he believed. He thought he was serving God by persecuting these Christians. And he realized that his understanding was all wrong. And the spirit began to feel the pangs of repentance because according to the narrative, he fasted and prayed for three days while he was blind. Now listen to this. What was he learning? He understood that the relationship of believers to Christ was such that you cannot hurt believers without hurting Him. That's why later on in the writings of Paul in his epistles, he will call the church the body of Christ. 
And where did they get the idea that the church, we, are the body of Christ on earth because of that encounter in Damascus? Na nakita niya na ang mga believers is so connected to Christ, whatever you do to them, you do it to Him. Kayo, we are the body of Christ on earth. Doon po nanggaling yung konsepto na yun. Na tiyatawag tayo katawa ni Kristo na narinig niya yun kay Jesus Christ. Listen to this. God cares about our relationships with one another. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, when you worship the Lord, and there you remember somebody has something against you, kasi nakasakit ka ng isang kapatid, ang sabi niya, leave your offering. I will not accept your offering. 23 to 24, Matthew 5. First, go and be reconciled with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift. Ibig sabihin, hindi ko tatanggapin yung worship mo kung may tao ka nasaktan na masama ang loob sa'yo, iwanan mo muna yung own offering. Hindi ko tatanggapin yan, ayusin mo muna ang relasyon mo. Humingi ka ng tawad. Mag-reconcile mo na kayo. At pag ganun, tatanggapin ko na ang pagsamba mo. You understand this? Because what hurts your brother hurts Jesus. What hurts you affects the Lord. You understand that? Okay? And that's why we're commanded to forgive one another and to be humble to before one another because God wants us to be united. This is the first experience of soul seeing the connection of the body with Christ himself. And what happened according to the narrative? Let's take a look. Verse 7, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Nabulag po si Saul. Bakit siya nabulag? Masyadong maliwanag yung, liwa, yung lingwanag, nag-flash siya kanya when Jesus appeared. The, the light was so blinding that he became blind. And he was blind for three days. Now listen to this. Bakit blindness? Bakit blindness ang ginusto ni Jesus na mangyari sa kanya? Because his physical experience was expressing this the situation or the state of his soul. He was so blinded to believe that by persecuting the Christians, he was doing God a favor. He thought that this was followers of a fake Messiah. He was so blind to the truth. That's why he was persecuting the Christians. And Jesus was now reflecting in his physical experience the state of his soul. In the midst of that blindness for three days, that's when he reflected on everything and began to realize how wrong he was. That was the moment of his conversion. Do you understand this? Let me tell you this. Sometimes we are so blind not to see what God is doing in your life in the midst of your crisis, disappointments, and challenges. Whenever you go through some pain or suffering, do not complain because you know something good is going to come out of that. But rather, ask God to help you see what He is doing. Ask God to give you a spiritual vision to understand what you are trying to teach, what He is trying to teach you at that moment. Ask God to help you see what He wants you to do in the midst of that crisis, to understand what, what is it that God is changing inside of you so that you will rise up above this experience and overcome it. Don't focus on the problem. Lalo ka lang papangit. Focus on what God is trying to say to you. You understand that? And many times we are so blind, that's why we respond in the wrong way and we just prolong our agony and our suffering. Lalo lang lumalala ang sitwasyon kasi mali ang response. Kasi hindi natin nakikita kung anong gustong ipakita ng Diyos. And that was the experience of Saul. By making him blind, he was showing him, this is what you are. This is what you have been. You're so, so blind. You don't see what I'm doing, that you're persecuting me. That when Stephen said, Napatawarin kita, patawarin kita. When he was there dying, and you approve of his execution, he said, Lord, do not lay this sin against him. Sabi ni, ni Stephen. And you heard that. And that has become like a thorn in your soul. I was trying to reveal to you, say to you, reconsider your reaction to these Christians. You understand that? When you're in the midst of darkness, pray for vision. I'm, talk, I'm talking about night vision. <laughs> you know what night vision goggles are? 
Kahit madilim, nakakakita ka. Yun ang kailangan mo pag nasa kadiliman ka. Kasi hindi agad-agad dadaling ka ng Lord sa liwanag. It may take time bago ka ilabas sa liwanag eh. Pero habang nandun ka sa kadiliman, humingi ka ng vision para maintindihan mo kung ano'y tinuturo sa'yo ng Lord. Para in the midst of the darkness, nagbabago ka, nag-grow ka. Kaya later on, na-overcome mo na yung kadiliman kasi marunong ka na mag-react at mag-respond na hindi ka na nasasaktan kasi nabago ka na yan. Amen? So can you say to the person beside you, when you're walking in the darkness, ask God for vision to see what He is changing in your life. Amen? And listen to this, He was only blind for three days. He will not be able to see until a disciple will come and pray over him and allow him to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? Three days. And so while he was waiting, look at verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. He said, Ananias, gagamitin ng Lord anong pangalan? You know what Ananias means? It's from the Hebrew, Kananaya, which means Yahweh is gracious. Mm -hmm. Bakit siya nang pinili ni Lord? Kasi he's about to reveal his grace towards Saul, the persecutor of the church. Grace means undeserved favor, unmerited, unearned favor from God. And the name of Kananaya, Ananias himself, was a message to Saul that God was going to use this man to show his grace towards Saul. You understand this? And so Kananaya received a vision telling him to go there and look at verse, uh, the verse. Yes, Lord, he said. Verse 11. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus whose name is Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he had seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Ano sinasabi ni Jesus? Ananias, wag ka na mag-worry sa mga introduction kasi na-introduce na kita sa kanya. Binigyan ko siya ng vision. Nakita kanya sa kanyang vision. Pumunta ka sa kanya, nilihas mo siya at gumaling siya. Kaya, pumunta ka na lang doon. Handa na siya. Amen? Sometimes you're, you know, you know what was the reaction of Ananias? He was really scared when he heard, Saul of Tarsus? Lord, terrorist yan. Bakit? Pinapapunta mo ako sa isang terrorist. In fact, we heard, continue the message. In fact, we heard that he came here in order to arrest the Christians here. Ibig sabihin, paano yung nalaman yun? Kasi mga Christians sa Jerusalem, tumakas doon. Kaya nalaman nila. You understand that? And so here, we find him saying, Lord, verse 13, Lord, can you say please, Lord? Answered, and as, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And you're telling me to come to him? That sentence yung Lord para sa akin. Ako na lumapit sa terrorist. Do you understand that? Could you identify with the fear of Ananias? Pero sabi niya, don't worry. Na-endorse na kita sa kanya. Kasi he will need you because he wants to see. Hindi kanya pwedeng padayin kasi ikaw magbibigay ng healing sa kanya. When God tells you to reach out to someone or to a group of people, and you know, this is the Lord, just obey. It is the Lord who will endorse you to them through His Holy Spirit. He will speak to their hearts and listen to you because you were commanded by Christ to come to them. You understand that? Kung may makamag-anak kayo, may burden kayo na mag-share ng gospel, ako, pag mag-share ng gospel, baka i-persecute ako, huwag mo nang isipin yun. Isipin, sundin mo si Lord, share mo si Jesus to them, baka hindi mo alam, handa na sila. Amen o ba? There will always be opportunities for you to share Christ to others. Bigyan mo ng regalo sa birthday ng isang tao, after some weeks, wala na yun. Lalo na pag chocolates, isang araw lang yun, ubus na. Rosas, mga ilang araw din yun, no? Bigyan mo ng Prigidaire, mga 10 years siguro, wala na yun. O baka 5 years pa lang, bulok na yun. Di ba? Ano mang regalo ibigyan mo sa mga kaibigan mo, hindi naman magtatagal yan eh. Pero listen to this. Share Jesus to them. And you're giving them everything. Because if they come to Jesus, He can change their lives. 
and they will receive so much blessing from God na hindi mo may bibigay. And I'm telling if you love your friends, you love your relatives, share Jesus to them. Because if you share Jesus to them, you're bringing everything into their lives. The blessings of God. Amen? Kaya kung sino ka mag-anak nyo na nagagalit kayo kasi eh, napik ka ng kuya mo, ng uncle mo, ng ano mo, patawarin mo na, i-bless mo sila, share Jesus to them. What brings salvation is when you show love to, the, to those who don't deserve it. When you show the love of Christ to those who don't even deserve that love. That is what opens heaven to reach out and transform those lives. Amen? Wag mo pong repay evil with evil, but with blessing. Amen? First Peter 3.9, that's our closing verse. What we're learning here is that God can use those evil to change your life. First Peter 3.9 I'm veering from my desired direction because the Lord is telling me right now to focus on this one. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. The more you bless those who hurt you, the more God's going to bless you. Pakisabi sa katabi, huwag ka nabalat si Buyas kasi. Share Jesus to that person because God can change his life. Amen? Hallelujah. Anyway, the conversion of soul was just the beginning. We will learn more about what's how God operates in your life as we look at how God operated in the life of soul. God wants to use your life to change other lives by showing them the love of Christ. A love that even is expressed in the face of offense and insult. Decision lang yan, Lord, i-bless mo sila, bahala ka na sa akin. Pero bless mo siya. Can you do that? And I tell you, Peter said, if you bless those who insult you and do evil to you, God, will bless you. Because Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, you become like your Father, who is good to the wicked and to the righteous alike. He sends His reign on the just and the unjust. Ang ating Father sa langit, kahit masama yung tao, kahit kriminal, kahit nakakakain pa rin sila araw-araw. Mabait siya kahit sa masama. Dahil gusto niyang mawin ang masama, pumalik sa Kanya. Romans 2.4 God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Kaya kain siya dahil gusto ko niyang kusang loob na bumalik sa kanya. Naintindihan po natin. Kaya pag tayo naging kain sa kaaway natin, sabi ni Jesus, you become like your father. You will honor your father when you show kindness to your enemy. Because the heart desire of the father is to win them. Not to condemn them, but to save them. Amen? Are you willing to be a channel of Christ's desire to win the lost? to win those people to Him. Show the love of Christ to them until that love brings them to the feet of Jesus. Love them until they come to Christ. Can you do that for Jesus? That is His desire. 